Hi, I'm Joe Roth. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and informing people about our life-saving mission. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Trends in maternity care next on Caucus New Jersey. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Felician College, Johnson & Johnson, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, the Russell Berry Foundation, NJM, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and more, with a focus on safety and financial stability. NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 college savings plan. Turn a dream into a degree. And by Verizon Communications. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. And by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. Welcome to Caucus, New Jersey. I'm Steve Adubato. You know, maternity care is always evolving. Today's mothers are well-informed and following their individual needs. Joining me here in the studio to discuss the newest trends in maternity care, we have Jill Wadnick, who is a birth doula and childbirth educator at the Montclair, Mater excuse me, Montclair Maternity. Dr. Arthur Gross is OBGYN at Englewood Hospital and Medical Center. We have Susan Peck. OBGYN nurse practitioner at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. And finally, Robin Dioria, executive director of the Central Jersey Family Health Consortium. Jill, let me get this right. It's the Montclair Maternity, which is? Uh, Montclair Maternity, I support community-based doulas, childbirth education, and improving birth outcomes for residents and organizations in New Jersey. You've said that before. I know that. You got that just right. Uh, by the way, we're going to have several uh, pieces of information throughout this program. Use the websites, use the information up there throughout this program, all about trends in maternity care. Um, interesting, because the more we were getting ready for this show, the more I'm thinking, wait a minute, trends in maternity care, doctor, women are less and less caught up in trends and more and more caught up, caught up in what is right for them. Is that not a fact? That, that is the trend. The, That's you know, the trend. Absolutely, we're in the information age. Everybody has access to, to expansive information on the internet. So people are, are, are looking in, they're educated when they come in. They, they haven't learned from their peers and from discussions among their friends. They, they've been able to get to a global database and they're coming in with knowledge and with power. And they're choosing what's right for them, not what their friend told them is best for them or not what their mother told them. Oh, it's, uh, Susan, let me ask you, uh, trends. There are a lot of trends that are no longer in vogue. I know we're, you know, maybe that sounds like a cliche, but mm -hmm. what was going on for a lot of women when it comes to maternity-related issues that no longer is the case? I believe that in the past, many women really thought that their providers, their obstetrical care providers, uh, were really in charge of how their pregnancy worked itself out over the 40 weeks and kind of dictated what their birth experience was like. And much to Dr. Gross's point, I think that now women are really evolving and having a say and more of an empowered role um, in that birth experience from the beginning of their pregnancy right through the postpartum period. So let's talk about what do you think most, even though it's very individual, you know? And I bet there's some women who think they want a certain experience, because I was thinking about this, getting ready for the show, there's pre-birth and then there's post, so let's try to play this out. I bet there's a lot of women who think they know what they want, and then they're into the experience and that evolves. Is that a fair assessment? I do. And or I do think you sit there and go, I know what I want, that's it. And no, I think there needs to be an ongoing evolution. As a baby grows, there really is not only the biological component, but the social, emotional, and even spiritual component that families need. And I think what, what my word would be to really highlight Susan's good words would be respectful care. That is what is true, and that... Break that down. Respectful care. So respectful in terms of how women can be um, collaborative decision makers about how they're treated, about access to information, and about best practices. Maternity care continues to really spend the most money and sometimes get the worst outcomes in our country as a whole. And so we can find these pockets where women has, have sometimes been at the crossroads of um, not getting evidence-based care. And hopefully that trend is changing. 
What do you think most women, again, even though it's very individual, what do you think most women want? Sometimes their family takes a role that may be contradictory to what they want for their pregnancy and for that. their baby. Breastfeeding. Maybe oh, they... I, I was wondering how long it would take. <laughs> Didn't take long. Five minutes or less. <laughs> it, it always comes up. Breastfeeding is something that many women, and especially when they do the research, they realize this is something that's good not only for them, but especially for their baby. And at times, that may be contradictory to what grandma wants, or even her husband or the father of the baby. And that can cause a lot of anxiety for everyone involved. So here's the question. Does it really matter when it comes to maternity care and, you know, again, the pregnancy and then after um, the baby is born and a woman becomes a mom, does it matter what anyone else thinks that mom should do other than the mom? Does it really matter? Your husband says this, friends say that, your grandmother says this, your mother says that, your aunt says this, the people down the street say that. Does it really matter? other than what is best for that woman? What's what should matter? <clears throat> Absolutely matters what is best. And, and that sometimes is not what the patient wants. So it, it's important for a practitioner to help guide a patient and, and to say, for example, the most appropriate action is A versus B. So that it does matter, but it also matters what they want and, and sometimes what they want becomes the most appropriate. For example, when, when we look at testing, screening early in pregnancy for aneuploidies, chromosomal abnormalities, there's a variety of different methods you, you can take. Some of them are more risky to the pregnancy. Some are less risky but, but less accurate. Which one is best for a patient is, is her choice. What is most in important In consultation to with? The medical professionals. No, the medical professionals' obligation is to help her understand her choices and what the repercussions of each choice is. But which choice is best for her in that situation is what she feels most comfortable, what works for her family and her ethic. Sometimes there are just clear, clear choices that there, there is no decision that, that makes it better or worse. It's just empiric data. This is the safest thing for you. But more often than not, it's about what's best for the patient from her perspective. There's a judgment call. Yeah, and it's her judgment. I'm curious about this. Um, when we talk about trends in maternity care, comfortable surroundings kept coming up, like a woman being in very comfortable surroundings to have her baby. You're smiling. Well, yeah, because Talk about um, that. I hope By that like, that how woman... How what a doula is? Oh, sure. A doula does... Knows non-medical, emotional, social, and educational support during pregnancy. So there is a lot of individual woman-to-woman -woman care. And she's a mentor and guide never to replace the partner or husband, but is trained in the physiology of giving birth and being born. So she's mm. there doing labor support. That's great stuff. As you talk about um, comfortable surroundings, we're actually going to show some video from your place, right? Yeah. Okay, let's talk about it. From so Englewood. Go ahead. I'm going to start with, I hope she was comfortable when she made the baby. I thought <laughs> she was, should be comfortable there. So right. that really, you know, really birth is part of reproductive health, right, in the, in the life cycle. So um, a woman needs to feel safe, secure, private, and comfortable. And, and that is going to look different ways. So the aesthetics matter. We're looking at, you know, the aesthetics of not just the clinical stuff over here, doctor, on the screen, but like the room itself. Like if a, I remember we've had four kids, right? Um, two wives. <laughs> I feel like Larry King every time I do that. Seven <laughs> wives? No. Um, but every situation I remember what the room was like. Yeah. I don't know why I remember what the room looked like and how comfortable that room was, what the, what the walls looked like, you know, whether there was any sunlight. All those things mattered. And I thought, I'm not having a baby. But I imagine... If it feels antiseptic, if it feels clinical, if it feels cold, that can't feel good for a woman, no? Am I so, making too much of that? No, I, I mean, I certainly think your memories are of the situation of the maternity suite are ingrained in your mind from a special day. But I think we have to kind of look before then. And what I hope my practice and myself as a practitioner really provides to the patient is 
that feeling of comfort, of being cared for, of being on this experience together, as Jill was mentioning, from day one of their prenatal care. Prenatal. Pre, prenatal and during her pregnancy. Right. So I think that that relationship, that feeling of comfort, that feeling of acceptance, um, of safety, is important from very, very early on. Describe what that looks like. Because it to, sounds great and people are saying, yeah, I'm in, I like that. But mm -hmm. give us a concrete example of what that looks like. To me, it looks very simple. And you don't need special aesthetics or a certain look or feel of your office setting. It's simply how you interact and communicate and support your patients. Um, listening to them, guiding them, as Dr. Gross was talking about, um, through certain perhaps difficult decision-making possibilities that come up. Um, helping them to achieve the best, safest outcomes through the support and evidence-based guidelines and medicine that you provide to them. But it, it's more than that. It's a Being relationship. There. Being there? It's a long relationship. Well, it's a 40-week relationship. You know, and being there at that critical moment, yeah. that special moment, help me on the movie, was it Katherine Heigl, is that her name? Help me on the movie where she's with oh, Seth Rogen, which yes, is yes. hard to believe already. But um, <laughs> so they're in the movie together, and what is it? She's knocked up, right? Yes. And they're, she's having the baby, and she's in the bathtub, and they're trying to get the doctor. And I know it's Hollywood's version of things, but you're smiling because? Oh, no. I, Do you know the scene? And her doctor is not there. The doctor's, right. not, the doctor's not there, and he's screaming mm -hmm. just to get the doctor there, and they have another doctor. Right. Is that so even close to? It, it's possible, but I think that comes down to expectations. I mean, certainly. What should the expectations be? I think the expectation should be honesty up front. We know that with the way healthcare is delivered, having a private practitioner or a solo practitioner as an obstetrician is really becoming a thing of the past. Is that true? Um, and larger groups or groups that kind of cover for each other when necessary are more commonplace. And so I think being upfront with that also adds to the comfort level of the patient and her partner and the feeling of safety. Uh, jump in here, doctor. I, so it's not that real, I like the idea of managing expectations. It's not that realistic for people watching, women watching, to say, I want my doctor, I want him or her to be dedicated to me throughout this period of time and when the time comes, I want that physician to be there. Thing of the past, that's what we just said. The, the trend is away. Um, it's very, very you get difficult. get someone in my group. Somebody in my group, yes, you, that you'll get, but, but an individual practitioner, harder and harder. Remember, e even just from the basic pragmatics, a soloist cannot be up every single night of the week. She can't be available every day of the year. My wife is a soloist. Is that right? But yeah, but you know, when, when I'm out at the hospital and it's her turn not to be on call, she can't go in because we have young children at home. Somebody, somebody has to stay home and, and vice versa. There are some nights where we're just not available and patients have to understand that personal lives of physicians really don't allow them to be 24 seven. But and I like what's being said about managing expectations. Right, yeah. Let's talk mm -hmm. about this. And that's where a doula would come in because a doula does continuous, oh. uninterrupted support, but not the clinical assessment. But you're, hold on then. Let me be clear. The doula's not changing up and saying there's someone else. Like you're, you're dedicated. You cannot do the clinical work, but right. what can you do to help that woman who may want the one physician, he or she may not be able to be there at a certain time, you can do what? Well, like going back to managing expectations, but also really providing the continuity of support. So she really feels um, empowered, encouraged, she feels heard, and she has her own experience even if um, she's attached to someone catching her baby, a different provider might have to come in. But hopefully she's so in harmony with her experience of, being, of having respectful mm. care. Let me try this one. Um, pain management? I don't know why that's coming to mind, only because I guess I've seen some things uh, around childbirth. Uh, I've seen, I've heard discussions, let's just say, about I want to have a natural childbirth. That's what I want to do. And I, I've known some women who have had that idea and have had a wonderful experience. I've known some other women who say, don't talk to me about that because I, it just doesn't work for me. Go back to the individual thing again. Pain management. Um, I'm going to go back to a trend thing again. 
Are there trends here, or, or let me ask you this, what are you seeing for most women when it comes to the issue of natural childbirth versus the use of medication to manage the pain? I think it depends on what you term natural as well, because some people will say natural, which means no epidural, but maybe I will have some narcotics during the labor. Others will say I want nothing at all, and maybe I'll use a bath or shower and other interventions that have no drugs involved, but also are used for pain. There are others, just like you said, that, said, that say as soon as I get into the hospital, I want my epidural, have the anesthesiologist there, and I need to have uh, And describe what an epidural is for those who do not know. It's an injection that goes into the back, into the, uh, where the spinal column right. is, that actually numbs. It doesn't necessarily go directly into the spinal column, but medication then goes to the nerve endings in an area that numb a person from about lower waist on down so that they don't feel pain, but it doesn't necessarily mean that their lower extremities or legs don't move. Are fewer women doing that? Doctor, is, or you've seen any, I can use the word trend again, do you see more or less women doing it? Since I came out in private practice in 96, I think the trend has gone upward. So it used to be a little harder to, to convince a patient an epidural might be an option. Now it's harder to convince them that maybe an epidural isn't their best option. but. But the trend is, again, moving forward with patient empowerment and patient education to let them understand what the array of options for them is and to provide them with those options and to help them understand it's a dynamic process. Nobody can anticipate what labor will be like for them personally. Right. So let them know what their options are, educate them in, in how those options will affect their process, and then help them during the, the labor to understand which, where direction they might want to go. We just put in a huge obstetrical suite at Angwood Hospital with hydrotherapy, with in-house, continually present anesthesiologist, with all sorts of, of psychosocial programs to help patients relax during labor and allow them to explore these options. And that's what's important. Let them have options. everything and, and pick out what they like. Speaking of options, elective induction is what? What is elective induction? Elective induction can be for a medical indication or, as I like to call it, a social indication. What is it? So an induction of labor is medically starting labor prior to when the body would have naturally gone into labor. So that can okay. be done through different ripening agents in the vagina or through intravenous infusions of um, hormones okay. to start contractions. So there are different reasons why it is done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's not a question of is it good or bad, it's a question of how it's used, is that fair? That's absolutely. Um, there's been a, a big campaign with the March of Dimes and with national maternal infant health providers to eradicate elective inductions, and that means without a medical reason. We wouldn't want an elective induction before 39 weeks, but we would still utilize them appropriately if there is a medical need. We're clear on this, doctor? You want to add something on elective induction? Because I looked at this and I was like, Okay, so who would use that? Why would they use it? What would be the rationale? And so it has to be very select cases. Some patients should never be subjected to elective induction. For example, a, a nulliparous patient, a patient having their first child, should really never electively, meaning by choice, without a medical indication, be, be induced. There, there are dangers. A person who's on her third child, who's past 39 weeks, so there's no issue of what we call iatrogenic prematurity, forceful prematurity by medical consequence. Those patients, if they're the right physical candidate, if their cervix is favorable, et cetera, mm. may be a good candidate for elective induction based on their social needs. Say a person is a transplant to the community, has children at home, has very limited availability for, for child care if she leaves unexpectedly in the middle of the night she might find that it's a big case benefit case. to her. Yeah. What about the underserved population? What about folks who do not have the means, folks who live in certain communities, underserved communities, folks uh, that live in communities that healthcare has not been so easily accessible to them? <sighs> Talk about maternity issues, maternity trends there. What do we see? I often access to maternity care is an issue, whether it be transportation to get to a clinic, it may be once you get to the clinic, there is an extraordinary, extraordinary wait time so that 
if there's no child care available, imagine yourself going yeah. to a clinic thinking you have your appointments within a half an hour, having to wait more than an hour, maybe two hours, having young tri children with you. It's lunchtime. What do I do? How should I access and should I go for prenatal care or maybe not because the amount of money that it costs to get there, the amount of time I have to spend there may be better spent at home. So access is huge in that population so, in so particular. We're talking about choices. We're talking about um, you know what kind of room you want, whether you have a doula or not, you know, or which doula that is, or which medical group you go with, which hospital you're in, all these issues. The epidural or not, right? But for a whole range of women out there, they don't have, I mean, look at the choice you just described. Mm -hmm. Do I get prenatal care in a public health setting that it may take a couple of hours, even though my appointment's mm -hmm. at 10, I'm being seen at 11.45. Mm -hmm. And if I do that, what am I giving up in terms of the rest of my family and the money I was, what kind of choice are we talking about? So then they opt not to get prenatal care. What are we talking about then? then we're talking about potential outcomes that we don't want. You know, I mean, so much of good obstetrics. Because what are you finding out when you get real good prenatal care? You're uncovering uh, uh, problems that could occur, complications, things that are manageable. That you could do something of about. Of course. And if you don't pick them up, right? Right. Well, and this is, I used to run a community doula program for Medicaid enrolled women in Hudson County, New Jersey. And we were exclusively working at the Medicaid Clinics. Folks and who are having a hard time getting absolutely, access. Absolutely. And um, it wasn't, so the issues that Robin brought up are critical, but even during labor and birth, they, um, many of our Medicaid enrolled moms were not allowed out of bed to, to, ha to labor. And lack of access to vaginal birth after cesarean, which is called VBAC, is a critical social justice issue. Whoa, 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 you lost me there. Yes. A after some, uh, a woman has a C section. Yeah the fact that she's less likely to have the option of having a baby vaginally yes. is a social justice issue? Yes. Because? Well, because um, every, you know, every surgery increases hospitalization and risk, and um, they're really, it, it improves outcomes. It's safer for mothers to not have surgery. When we need surgery, we need good sure. surgery, right? But if we're overutilizing a surgical response um, on healthy women, so the state of California, um, South Carolina, Oregon, many Medicaid states are focusing on access to vaginal birth after cesarean. New Jersey? Um, I'll let Robin speak for that. I can't speak for, uh, has, for the Have we done Avengers. this? What we're doing is we're actually looking more at what are some alternatives to prenatal care that may be more conducive to getting women to uh, to go for prenatal care. For example, rather than your traditional prenatal care, not unlike what I just right. described, we're looking at alternatives. One of those is group prenatal care or centering pregnancy. And we were fortunate enough to receive a grant, so we were able to support a number of clinics within the state, and particularly in Newark, New Jersey, and throughout Central Jersey, where women come together as a group, ten, approximately 10 women for the entire length of their prenatal uh, care experience for their pregnancy. And in that group, not only do they get examined by the doctor, but then they have the time to socially interact with other women. What we're finding is these same women who had poor outcomes, as was described, are not, and in fact, are going to term not having preterm births. Their babies are born heavier, and they're going to term women are staying in prenatal care longer, and in fact, we're seeing then after delivery, postpartum, that they're coming back and forming relationships. So what started as just going to the doctor is now becoming a lifelong event, right. and we're teaching skills that can then be translated. Doctor, in the time we have left, the trends that you see in maternity care moving forward in the next five to 10 years, most significant trends, how do you think it's gonna change? Oh, I, I think that, that this patient-directed care is going to patient evolve. Patient-directed care. Translation. Looking for the individual needs of, of the individual patient, humanistic medicine. Take, taking the patient's needs and concerns and applying them to her individual standards instead of trying to cookie-cutter every patient. 
So the message to women out there is we know other people have opinions on things. Whoever in your family, whomever, people in the neighborhood, your friends. In the end, it's ultimately about what that woman believes is best for her in consultation with her physician, right? Absolutely. Educate yourself. Utilize your, your provider to educate you further, to, to help put things in context. We'll keep talking off the air. And then make decisions. Thank you all. Very much. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence, and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Felician College, Johnson & Johnson, New Jersey Sharing Network, the Russell Berry Foundation, New Jersey Manufacturers, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, Turn a Dream into a Degree, and by Verizon Communications. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. Hi, I'm Peter Rooney. In 2006, I lost my father to renal disease. He was on the waiting list for a new kidney, but did not receive one in time. Unfortunately, so many like my father have lost their lives while waiting for a life-saving organ. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and by informing people about this important decision, because you can make a difference and save a life.